Okay, today's discussion is on what's called differential analysis or incremental analysis. <clears throat> and the concept is pretty straightforward. Uh, what we're doing is we're looking at alternatives. Okay, should we choose decision A versus decision B? And when we're trying to analyze which path to take, we have to make sure we're considering only the relevant issues and not considering irrelevant issues. Okay, and we'll give you examples of what constitutes an irrelevant issue. A relevant cost is a cost that differs between choice A and choice B, whereas if you're going to incur the same cost regardless, it's irrelevant. Okay, and so that's really the focus here is that will the cost and revenues be different if we choose one path or the other, or are some of those costs going to remain the same? If they're going to remain the same, then it's not part of our consideration process. If we can avoid a cost, it's relevant. If we can't avoid a cost, it's irrelevant. I'll give you some examples. Sunk costs and certain future costs that would not be different. So let's just say you're trying to decide which class you want to take. And when you have to think about what class you have to take, you have to look at the time schedule, who's teaching it, is it a hard class versus an easy class? Do you have to buy extra stuff? Those are the relevant issues. Your car is irrelevant, okay? It's a, what's called a sunk cost. You've already bought your car, and regardless of which class you take, it has no effect on the decision. Another irrelevant cost is the cost of the gas to drive to campus, because both classes are on campus, so you're going to have to spend that gas anyway. So those are examples of irrelevant costs. Now, if the decision is between an on-campus and an online class, that's a different story. Okay? Then these issues become relevant. But if you're taking both classes online or both classes on campus, then those are examples of irrelevant costs, sunk costs, and a future cost that's not going to differ. Okay, so these are the scenarios we're going to look at. There are others in your textbook, but we're just going to look at these items. Should we lease it or sell it? Um, if we have an unprofitable division or segment or product, should we discontinue it? Should we accept an order at a special price, what we call a special order, coming in from outside of our nor normal market parameters, okay? And it might be a bulk order and the, what they're going to pay us per unit is a little bit different. Should we accept that order? Should we continue to manufacture it, or should we buy it and outsource the manufacturing? Okay, a lot of big companies do this. And should we sell it now or continue processing it? Okay, so we're going to look at these issues, and we'll try to identify what's relevant, what's irrelevant. Okay, lease or sell one of our machines. Now, the machine costs 240 and as a book value of 110, this is irrelevant, okay? What's relevant is how much revenue we would get from leasing it versus selling it and what costs are associated with leasing versus selling. Book value is sunk, therefore it's irrelevant. Okay, I can lease this uh, piece of equipment for five years. I would have revenue of 170000 and the various expenses that go along with maintaining the machine and leasing it would be $55,000, zero salvage at the end of the lease. If it had a salvage value, that would factor into the consideration. Okay? Or I can sell it at $110,000, and I'll incur a 5% commission on the sale. Okay, now, these are pretty simple numbers, and you can probably pretty quickly uh, determine what course of action you'll take. Okay, so... Okay, just a quick peek at this slide here. We've kind of talked about this stuff. Here's the, here's the analysis. Revenues. Okay, we call the 60,000 is the differential revenue. It's the difference in revenue between the choices. Differential expense, 49.5, and differential income, 10,500. And as you probably calculated in your head, it makes more sense for us to lease the equipment than to sell it. Okay, and of course, in real life, these decisions will be more complicated than this, but we always start off simple to illustrate the concept. Okay, should we discontinue an unprofitable part of our business? Okay, we have to consider the impact on the other existing lines, product lines, or other businesses. 
Now, in many cases, fixed costs that have been charged to this unprofitable segment aren't going to go away, and they're going to have to be allocated to existing products. And that becomes a big consideration. Okay? And what we may find is that net income may actually go down when we eliminate an unprofitable segment. Okay, let's take a look. This company makes three different types of golf clubs. And notice the champ is losing money. Okay, now here we revisit an older concept called the contribution margin. You may remember contribution margin, sales minus variable costs, is how much does the product contribute to first covering our fixed costs, and once fixed costs have been covered, then towards profitability. Well, the champ line has a $10,000 contribution margin, and that would go away. Remember, your revenues would go away, your variable costs would go away. Sometimes some of the fixed costs may go away, but many times they won't. In our example, the fixed costs are not going to go away. So we were contributing $10,000 to covering those fixed costs. That contribution margin disappears, and our income will drop by $10,000 as a result in total. Look at the far column there. Total revenues and expenses, we're making net income of 220 even with that 20000 loss. If we discontinue the champ line, then notice our income will drop by 10000 because we're losing that $10,000 contribution margin. So the key is, will fixed costs be eliminated? All, some, or none? Usually it's going to either be some might be eliminated or none will be eliminated. But rarely do you get rid of all fixed costs unless the product that you're discontinuing is manufactured in a completely different facility and that whole facility could be shut down, employees laid off, et cetera. Okay, then that becomes a different analysis. But it's very common for companies to produce multiple products under one roof, in which case with one factory, your depreciation, your property tax, your insurance, et cetera, isn't going anywhere. Okay, so using a differential analysis spreadsheet here, and by the way, this is another area where you don't have to use this particular format. If you like the contribution margin income statement we saw a moment ago, as long as you're drawing the right conclusion, that's the main thing. Okay, And here, notice we're coming up with the same uh, conclusion, and that is do not discontinue the champs or we'll lose $10,000. Okay, So this is just analyzing the difference in continuing versus elimination from a differential or incremental standpoint. A special order. Under a special order, there's a couple of important questions. And the first is, will it impair or affect my existing sales? So I'll give you an example. Um, let's just take a coffee store like Starbucks. If they open up another store too close to existing stores, then they're going to take away customers from store A, and they'll be satisfied at store B. That's called cannibalizing your existing business. So you have to make sure you don't cannibalize your existing business. You don't want to take away revenue from store A just because you're opening up store B. So will this affect our existing business? The other issue we have to consider is, do we have excess capacity in our manufacturing process or even or if it's a service-based business, do we have the capacity in terms of labor to satisfy this special order, which is probably outside of our existing market, without impairing our normal production or servicing schedule? Okay. Notice, if it will not affect existing sales, that's a good thing. It may result in certain costs increasing, such as special packaging, bulk packaging, or product design modifications for a special order. And other costs may go down. For example, we may not incur a commission since the call came in without anyone out drumming up the business. Again, will overhead costs be affected? If they will not be affected, they're not relevant. And the concept of excess capacity, can we handle this without disrupting our normal production schedule? These are the relevant concepts we have to think about in this decision process. OK, so now let's take a look at the data here. Customer offers to buy a special order of 3,000 units, and they're going to pay us $11 per unit. We normally sell the product for $20 per unit, so at first glance you're saying, whoa, that's way below our normal selling price. Notice it'll have no effect on our normal sales, no effect on plant capacity. 
our current variable cost per unit is eight bucks. We're going to incur a special order product modification of a dollar per unit. So our variable cost will be nine bucks per unit. Current fixed manufacturing costs of 500,000 spread out over our existing manufacturing is five dollars per unit. But the fixed costs are not going away. We're going to continue to incur those fixed costs. So really, we're analyzing the revenue coming in versus the variable costs. Okay, and notice that if we use the traditional total cost concept of $9 variable cost, $5 fixed cost, we're going to think we're losing 3 bucks a unit. But when we identify fixed costs as uh, not going away, therefore it's irrelevant, then really I'm going to make a couple of bucks per unit here. So notice, uh, revenue, differential revenue would increase uh, by 33000 our variable costs would increase by 27000 and our differential income would be $6,000, which is simply the 3,000 units times the $2 difference between our variable cost and our sales price. So pretty easy decision, except the special order. Okay, many companies have to decide whether or not they want to continue making a product or should they buy it and outsource. Okay, and, and this has been the plight of the American workforce is that everything goes overseas where the labor's cheap. I mean, Apple products and, and cars and, and, and computers and everything is being manufactured in the land of cheap labor. Okay, and so should we, if we outsource it, we're going to have to buy it from them at a cost per unit. But we're going to end up uh, getting rid of labor costs and the related costs associated with, uh, you know, perhaps... Um, uh, retirement benefits, uh, health benefits, uh, all the related labor costs, all the costs related to a facility might be able to sell the facility or use it for something else. So let's take a look at the example here. The following costs are incurred to make 25,000 units of a particular product. There's direct materials, direct labor. Remember, overhead can be variable or fixed. Okay. So there's a split between variable and fixed overhead. Total manufacturing cost, 225, divided by the 25,000 units, it costs us nine bucks a unit. Okay, now we can buy this for eight bucks a unit, okay, if we outsource it. That'll eliminate all the variable costs. And notice it says we can eliminate $10,000 of fixed costs, however, 50,000 of those costs remain. Now, what fixed costs would go away? It's possible a supervisor related to the, that particular product line. Maybe insurance could be modified. So you'd have to take a look at your fixed costs to see what would go and what would stay. In this case, 50,000 of the 60,000 is going to remain. Okay, so here's our analysis. If we continue to make it, there's the cost we're going to continue to incur, 225. However, if we buy it, we got to pay eight bucks a unit times 25,000, 200,000, but we're going to continue to incur that $50,000 of fixed costs. So notice in this particular case, it actually makes more sense for us to continue to manufacture it. Okay, now in real life, when companies decide to, should they have something manufactured in China, for example, well, what does it cost to ship raw materials to your China uh, manufacturing plant and then ship the finished goods back to the United States, as opposed to buying the raw materials here or in Canada or Mexico and then not having to deal with all these shipping costs. Would that offset the cost of labor? In many cases, the answer is no, as we all have seen. Uh, but these are some of the additional things that you have to consider, as well as tariffs, which are taxes on imports and exports. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So in this case, it makes sense to keep buying it. Okay. But we have to think about another thing, and this is where economics and accounting sometimes tangentially meet, and that is opportunity cost, the potential benefit that we may obtain if we take a different course of action. Okay? For example, could we use the facilities to seize some other opportunity? What's the impact on our employees, the morale of our existing employees? Would it violate union contracts? That type of stuff has to be considered. Farming out the manufacturing allows us to take advantage of using the facility and we can earn an additional 28,000 bucks of income. Well, then that factors in. Notice before, 
it would have cost us $25,000 more to buy it. But now, if we can make another $28,000 with the facility because we're no longer manufacturing it, then we'll actually be in the plus column by $3,000. Okay, so you have to consider opportunity cost issues before you make that decision. Think about gasoline, for example. This is a really good example. I think we used this in a previous lecture. Crude oil turns into multiple products. And just think of crude oil turning into um, asphalt and tar and kerosene and Vaseline and ultimately gasoline. Okay, there's all sorts of products that are based on petroleum. And so the question is, at what point should we sell? Should we sell it here? Or should we continue refining or processing and sell a more finished product down the road? And the obvious issue is, what's it going to cost to process further? And how much additional revenue would we get if we process it further? That is the issue. So it really comes down to a very simple scenario. And that is, will the revenues, additional revenues, exceed the additional cost, which is really the analysis in all these different scenarios, is identifying relevant revenues, relevant costs, and if revenues exceed costs, you take that path. Although remember, never forget the qualitative issues associated with any decision. OK. So here's the data. Cost to manufacture one unit, there it is. And there again is the split between variable and fixed overhead. Cost is 35 bucks. Selling it in its kind of raw state, for example, unfinished furniture, Okay, which some people like to buy that and either finish it themselves or they simply like that raw look. Okay, unsanded, unvarnished, etc. Uh, we can sell it for 50, cost 35. We have the excess capacity to finish the product, whatever it may be, and we can then sell it for an additional 10 bucks, 60 bucks per unit. Okay, and then it's going to cost us an additional two dollars in direct materials, two dollars in direct labor. Excuse me, four dollars in direct labor, and two dollars and forty cents a variable overhead, okay? And in this case, it's being applied um, as a basis of direct labor, okay? No change in fixed overhead. So a quick analysis here, you're going to draw the conclusion, I can make 10 bucks more revenue. I'm going to incur 2 plus 4 plus 240. That's $8.40 of additional variable costs. Again, make sure that you've correctly analyzed if fixed costs are changing or not. And it looks like we'll make a buck 60 per unit more if we process further. Okay, and there it is. Okay, so all these have a very common theme. This is not a difficult area, and that is identify what's relevant and then see if we're going to make more money choosing A versus B. And believe it or not, that is it. <laughs>